Hi there. This video is going to begin our discussion of chapter one, section three, which is all about how do we define civilization. In class and in our previous videos, we talked about the mechanism that makes civilization possible, the idea of more food leading to more people. And once you have more people, having those extra people allows them to focus on building up culture. But we never really talked about how we define what exact elements of culture we put together to mean uh, in total a civilization. So that's what this is all going to be about. So uh, we start off with these villages that appeared in the Neolithic period as humans began to settle down into a fixed location where they didn't have to move from place to place anymore. Now humans can start building up culture in ways that they hadn't been able to previously as hunter-gatherers, nomadic hunter-gatherers. So these villages become the sites where civilizations start to develop. And our textbook defines civilizations as complex, highly organized social orders. Although we'll get really into the much more important elements of civilization later in this PowerPoint. Most of these uh, civilizations though have some common uh, elements that you can look at regardless of where you're talking about. And the first of them is that the earliest civilizations developed independently near rivers. Rivers are super crucial. You're going to hear this over and over again in our class. Uh, and really, they're important for both obvious reasons and less obvious reasons. So obviously, for instance, um, water is important for life, right? Drinkable water. That's what potable means. Potable means drinkable. Um, drinkable water is crucial for life, human life, animal life, plant life. Um, and of course, rivers can provide that in great amounts. Um, so it makes sense that the earliest and most successful civilizations are also going to be around some of the most important and biggest rivers on the planet. Rivers are also useful, though, for transportation, um, both transporting people from place to place, but also goods uh, and any other materials uh, makes it a lot easier to move things around. Um, and then finally, rivers provide silt. Um, silt is this nutrient-rich uh, river mud or river muck, um, which um, is really useful for farming. Um, uh, if you've ever done gardening or worked in a garden and, and you notice that um, soils that uh, are enriched with nutrients are generally better than just regular old soil, um, uh, silt is kind of the same thing. Um, when rivers would flood, they would deposit all this nutrient-rich uh, silt, this muck uh, that's full of good stuff for, for growing. Uh, and uh, plants could really grow well on these. So um, having flooding rivers uh, allows not just for uh, water, drinkable water, um, but also allows for the development of even more fertile crops, thanks to the silt surpluses that they had. Now, of course, like we said, um, all of these civilizations require a population surplus. Um, you need lots of extra people. And to get those extra people, you have to have a surplus of food, right? An extra amount of food, excess of food. And not just extra food that will help support those new people that are not doing farming jobs, uh, but a surplus that's going to allow for future generations of people to be born so that you can keep growing your society into a bigger and bigger uh, numbers. As you have more and more people, you get job diversity. So a per, instead of everybody having to work on one type of thing, survival, now different people can work on providing food uh, while other people are working on other stuff, tools, uh, science, technology, all that stuff. Um, so this job diversity allows uh, uh, for everybody to focus on a specific thing, um, which of course leads to the development of more and more culture. Um, and this is also uh, responsible for the leaving behind of what we would call traditional economies. Uh, that is economies that rely on habit, that don't change, that are based on ritual or custom. Um, that's the sense of traditional, not in the sense of old fashioned, but in the sense of um, handed down from one generation to the other without very much change. Um, so the old economies that we had, maybe like bartering, are replaced by new economies. Um, because rivers are so important, 
uh, the people that didn't live near rivers or the people that never settled down, right? The people that kept living as nomads um, uh, were doing something else. They were creating their own ways of life, um, but they're not necessarily engaged in the same level of civilization development that we see um, at the more stable fixed location sites uh, that we associate with rivers. So for instance, there are a lot of people that live on steps uh, which are basically sparse, dry grasslands all over the world. Um, and because they don't have any rivers, the people, the humans that are living in those places can't develop civilization in the same way that people on rivers can. Um, so it's important to note that while um, human civilization primarily occurs near rivers, there are human civilizations that take place in other places. Um, however, um, um, those cultures couldn't be stable in the same way. They had to remain nomadic. Um, they still might develop elements of civilization, um, but not to the same way or the same extent that we see um, at river civilizations. Okay, so this map shows you a general gist of all of the different civilizations that we're gonna talk about, as well as the rivers that are associated with them. Um, this basically covers everything that we're going to talk about in the first part of our class. So in our class, we're going to begin with Mesopotamia, uh, and the two rivers there are the Tigris and the Euphrates. Uh, after that, we'll talk about Egypt, which is where the Nile is. Um, following that, we'll talk about the Indus Valley Civilization with the Indus River. And then we move over to China, where we talk about the Huang River and the, and the uh, Yellow River as well. Um, so um, this is kind of a quick... Uh, rundown on the different places that we're going to be talking about, but you notice that they all are grouped, these early civilizations, they're all grouped around rivers. So what do we define a civilization as, or how do we define civilization? Um, it's a complicated question, um, and there's lots and lots of different ways that people have divided up the qualities of what makes a civilization. But our textbook identifies eight specific features of civilization, okay? Um, and these are in order, cities, organized governments, complex religions, job specification, social classes, arts and architecture, public works, and writing. This is the definition that our textbook is using. If you have these eight elements, then the group of humans or the human society that you're talking about can be discussed or called a civilization. Okay, so we're going to go through these one by one and talk about them each. Uh, our textbook doesn't originally list cities as one of the features of civilization, but they say that they are the main feature of civilization. So I like to include them here with a little bit of extra emphasis as the first and probably the most important element of a civilization, the main feature of a civilization. Okay, the reason is if you don't have a place for lots and lots of humans to live, then humans can't engage in any of the other elements of civilization, right? If humans aren't just setting up shop in a single spot, right, then they're not gonna be able to escape that nomadic lifestyle, and they're not gonna be able to take part in any of the other elements of civilization. So this is arguably, in my mind, the most important element of civilization. Our textbook calls it the main feature of civilization. Um, and you can imagine what a city is, right? There are these population centers that allow for all the other features of civilization to exist because if a, people don't have a place to be, then they can't do any of these other uh, elements of civilization. The next one to talk about is organized governments, okay? Um, originally, early on in human history, probably back in the Neolithic period or maybe even in the uh, Paleolithic period, Maybe we had some sort of like council of elders or maybe some chiefs, some important characters who acted as sort of the de facto leaders for human groups. Um, but as time goes on and the groups of people get bigger and bigger and their needs grow and change, this old system of simple, you know, village elders, village chiefs doesn't work. And so they needed to expand into something that was a little bit more complex. And so we develop a system of government whose main job really is to organize the labor that keeps the food supplies going, keeps the, the stuff of the civilization going that's gonna allow for the population to thrive. So food production, irrigation, um, canals, flood control, housing, all of that stuff, right? 
somebody has to kind of keep an eye on all those things. And since everybody is, you know, needing um, uh, these things to function, um, but nobody necessarily is the one person who should be in charge of doing it, you have to set up some sort of government to oversee the whole process. Okay? Um, most of these governments aren't just governments of one person, even though there might be a single king or a single ruler who is very important. Um, the governments usually are going to involve um, a, a leader who then has several subordinates, some sort of lower power of people who work for that ruler. Um, that's what a subordinate means. I mean, a below rank, somebody who is lower in rank. Okay. Uh, these could be uh, government officials uh, like tax collectors, or they could be sort of um, people doing the day-to-day -day work like law enforcement um, people. Typically, at the start of civilizations, uh, we have a priest ruler because obviously the gods are very important. And so the person who is uh, able to talk to the gods or work with the gods would generally be very important. Priest rulers, though, very quickly get replaced by warrior rulers because um, obviously, you know, uh, you could pray to a god to protect your, your burgeoning city. Um, but if your city gets destroyed, you're going to wish that you had had somebody that was a little just more powerful and able to fight with a sword as opposed to just praying. Um, and so warrior leaders typically take over uh, from priest leaders due to practical concerns. Um, but then eventually those two roles kind of get merged together. And so we often have uh, in civilizations as a sort of warrior priest who is in charge or a, a warrior leader who is somehow connected to the religious world. Usually those kinds of rulers are hereditary, meaning that they pass on their power to their uh, uh, heirs, to their children, to their descendants. Um, but not always. Um, oftentimes the case, but not always. Okay. Talking about religion a little bit, the next feature of civilization is complex religions. Okay. Um, most of the religions that we see uh, in the ancient world are polytheistic meaning that they have many gods or multiple gods, as opposed to being monotheistic, in which case they have one god. Uh, gods in early human civilizations are typically connected to uh, nature, natural events or natural things, or very important human activities. And usually what happens is they start off with natural things. Um, they're associated with natural concepts, fire, air, uh, plants, animals, that sort of stuff. And then as human civilization evolves and changes, uh, humans try to find a way to fit these nature gods into their human world. So a god who may have been in charge of uh, weather, for instance, picks up um, uh, being the god of justice, for instance, um, which is a human concept that doesn't exist in the natural world. So usually a mix of nature and human activity uh, elements in these gods, and usually it's the first uh, the nature stuff before the human stuff. Um, these uh, gods require all sorts of elaborate worship, things like ceremonies and rituals and dances and prayers and hymns and sacrifices. And of course, the need to make those things happen properly helps to push cultural achievement, cultural advancement, cultural technology moving forward, right? So if you build a little hut for a temple to a god, and it's considered to be not very good, the only way to improve that for the god is to then invent better architecture or better engineering. Um, if you know a, you want to sing for a hymn or a song for a god, but that doesn't exist yet, you have to invent some sort of music or musical instruments. Okay, So um, the need to do things for the religion of the culture um, helps to push other elements of that culture along. Um, Organized religions also usually involve the creation of a class of people in the society who are uh, important, who are priests, uh, so who are formally, or their job, their formal job is religious work. Um, and they often are an intelligent group, um, often involves a lot of study, involves a lot of intellectual work. Um, and so the priest class of early human societies typically tends to be an educated sort of intellectual class uh, as a sort of side effect of needing to do all that other stuff. Um, a good example, for instance, is um, how are you going to properly enact the rituals for the gods? Well, 
you probably need to learn to read so that you can read the rituals. Um, whereas other people whose job is not to do that have less of an incentive to learn how to read. Um, so priests typically end up being very intelligent um, in the ancient world uh, because of the fact that they are uh, driven uh, accidentally almost um, to become smarter because of the needs of their job. Job specification is the next element of technology, or sorry, of uh, civilization. Um, and we've talked about this, right? Um, more food means more people. Those extra people that you have are going to specifically work on a specific job. So they take up a certain job. So now not everybody is doing everything. One person becomes a farmer. One person becomes a tech person. Another person becomes a, a politician. Another person becomes a priest and so on and so forth, right? So we've explained this concept before, and it's one of the ways that we uh, are able to determine whether something is a civilization or not, is whether or not we see job specification. Um, we already talked about how this means that new skills, new technology, new ideas get pushed, uh, but we also see another class of people being created, right? So complex religions led to a priestly class of people. Job specification, um, is part of the reason why we start to get craftspeople, um, also called artisans, people who work with art, ars in Latin, um, uh, but not just art in the sense of painting or sculpture, art in the sense of any skill. Um, so the people that focus on uh, crafts uh, become a new level of society, um, and we call these people artisans. Um, and you can see some examples of different types of artisans there. Um, Importantly, uh, and something we haven't really discussed, uh, but which is very important, um, job specification or job diversity, by definition, means that people are going to become more reliant on each other. If I don't know how to grow food, I have to just work with the people that do. And the people that focus on growing food have to rely on others around them to help them make tools, do other things, right? So interdependence, the, the fact that people need to rely on each other, the people that have different skills need to rely on each other, um, becomes more and more important uh, in a civilization. Uh, it's impossible to kind of just live your own life without working with or interacting with anyone else, because since you have specialized in a specific job, other people are going to take care of the other jobs for you. So it's impossible to kind of live on your own without interacting with anybody. We've talked about different social classes. We talked about a priestly class. We've talked about an artisan class. We've talked about government people. Um, and so it's no surprise to see that one of the features of civilization is job classes or social classes, uh, primarily ranked according to jobs. Um, the pattern is pretty similar across all of the cultures that we deal with. Typically, priests and nobles are at the top of the social hierarchy. Um, these are the most important people in society and usually the smallest group. Those below them are wealthy merchants um, who have a lot of power thanks to their money. Underneath them are the artisans that we talked about previously. And then the largest group, the biggest group, is generally the farmers who have the lowest status, the least amount of money. Um, even though they're the biggest group. And the reason why they're the biggest, of course, is because um, we need food to survive. Um, and having more food to lead to more people is always going to be one of the biggest drivers of um, human life, human day-to-day -day activity. Um, so they are the biggest group because they provide all the food, which allows for everybody else to survive. Okay. Now, we haven't talked about enslaved people yet. Um, uh, there are uh, enslaved people in many of the ancient societies that we talk about, um, and they typically are the lowest ranking people in society. Although, of course, um, many of the societies that we talk about don't even list slaves as people. Um, they're sort of outside of the social rankings um, because enslaved people were treated like property. They were treated like things rather than human beings, um, which, of course, is despicable. Um, but, uh, we often don't see slaves listed on sort of images of the hierarchy of the different social classes, um, because they're oftentimes considered to be outside of 
um, the social hierarchies, but they are there in pretty much all the ancient societies that we're going to talk about. Um, and they come from lots of different sources. Sometimes people are enslaved because of debts. Um, sometimes they're enslaved because of, of punishment legally. Um, by and large, the biggest way that people were enslaved was because they were taken captive in a war. They were fought and they were captured um, and made into a slave due to um, some sort of war activity. Um, um, and many of the slaves that we see in the ancient world are females and children, although there are males, but not as many males. Um, and of course, the reason is uh, for that, uh, or why we see less males or fewer males, um, is because of the fact that most of the time, if war is the primary way that you're taking uh, people as slaves, most of the people that are fighting in the war are going to be males, um, and they're going to fight and die rather than um, be enslaved. Um, so we do see um, males. Um, we see fewer males sometimes, um, but we see lots of females and children slaves. Um, and part of that reason is because the males are fighting in the army. We also talk about art and architecture as an important element of civilization. Um, uh, art and architecture is really useful because it tells us a lot about the other things that are going on in a civilization's mind. So when we look at a painting that is done by an ancient person, um, depending on what that painting shows us, we can then figure out other things about their culture. We can figure out how they thought about the world around them. Um, same with architecture. If we see that our, uh, the architecture for temples is particularly uh, breathtaking or particularly expensive in an ancient city, uh, then we can tell that they really must have thought very highly of their gods. So art and architecture can reflect the ideals of a civilization. Um, usually, though, there are some categories that, or there are some trends that we see repeated. Um, temples and palaces tend to be the biggest things because uh, priests and nobles, the people that live or need temples and palaces, um, are the most important people in society. Um, so the architecture reflects the status of the people. Um, and rulers typically could use uh, art and architecture as a way to promote uh, the things that they wanted to promote, uh, uh, specifically their own rule. So, you know, if a ruler builds a gigantic, impressive palace, um, that helps to show how great of a ruler he is. Or if he builds gigantic walls to keep the city safe, um, that use of architecture is there to help promote how he is protecting the city. So. Art and architecture is both for its own aesthetic enjoyment purposes. We can enjoy looking at art uh, or we can enjoy those things, but we can also use it for um, very sort of practical purposes too, if we are rulers of a civilization. We also have public works. Public works are any sort of projects, uh, generally gonna be er uh, engineering projects, which the government is in charge of which are designed to help all of the people of the civilization. Um, so things like building roads or bridges, walls, irrigation projects to help with farming. If the government is kind of working on a big building project to help uh, with um, all of the people of the city, this is generally considered a public work. Um, and like you can see, it's generally about helping the city improve its quality of life, protect the people protect their supplies. Um, but of course, it also makes rulers look good um, in the same way that, that we were just talking about with architecture. Um, and public works uh, are public, as in the government is in charge of them, because they often require a lot more money and labor and sacrifice than one person or one group of people is willing to undergo. Um, it's a huge project, generally, to create some sort of public work. Um, and so it's uh, taken over by the government because of those expenses. And you can see sometimes I have a note there that says sometimes people die in the creation of some public works projects um, because they were that dangerous. Um, uh, but they were so needed to keep the city afloat uh, that um, uh, a ruler would be willing to make those kinds of sacrifices. Finally, we have writing. Uh, writing is often thought of as being the most important sign of civilization, although it's not, according to our textbook. Our, most, our textbook says that the most important thing, the, the foundation of civilization, is 
cities, right? Because without people, you wouldn't have any of those things. Um, and the other thing to point out is that not every um, civilization has a writing system, or at least one um, that we can decipher. Um, uh, but um, it is important. Um, all of the civilizations that we talk about as developing on their own also developed their own writing systems on their own. They didn't share writing systems. So we see lots of different ones throughout the ancient worlds. Um, and they're all different. But as far as how they were created, um, there's a lot of different potential ways that these things might have gotten started. Um, some people think that writing systems developed as a way of recording stocks, as in how much stuff do you have in your city, the stock levels. Um, so, you know, we have this many jars of olive oil, this many um, bushels of grain, that sort of thing, right? You got to write that stuff down um, so that you know how much you have, so you can plan out what you're going to need later. Um, and some people think that writing was uh, invented as a way of keeping track of those things. Um, some people think that writing developed as a way to make sure that you were doing your rituals for the gods properly, so you wouldn't anger the gods by accidentally saying the wrong thing. Uh, and some people think that they were primarily invented, writing was invented as a way for rulers to write propaganda uh, up in public places uh, for everybody else to see. Propaganda is basically messages designed to make you think a certain way about the government. Um, um, and so, you know, if a ruler invents writing to put, I'm the greatest, here's why everybody should like me on, you know, some public building, um, that could be seen as an incentive for them to want to, to write, to learn how to write. So writing uh, could have been developed for all these different uh, reasons. However, um, all of them start off, all these systems of writing start off as what we call pictographs or pictograms, meaning drawings that look like what they are supposed to represent. So originally, all writing systems begin with a symbol for cow that is meant to look like the word cow, or look like an image of a cow, right? It's a pictogram of the word cow. But then later on, as time goes on and it changes, it stops looking like a cow and takes on some other uh, meaning or it starts to look like something else. We'll see lots of examples of how these uh, writing systems start as pictographs or pictograms and then develop into much more symbolic um, abstract uh, symbols. But we'll do that later on. Uh, out of all of this, though, it's important to note that uh, this uh, type of writing um, is very difficult to learn, requires a lot of effort and a lot of study. Um, and as a result, writing systems uh, allow for the creation of a new kind of uh, person in society, a scribe. A scribe is a person that specifically focuses on learning how to read and write. And they often have a very important place in society, uh, in ancient society. Um, because uh, since most people didn't know how to read and write, these guys uh, were very, very important in government. And sometimes they even had very high status in um, society. They would be very high up on the social ladder. Um, so we will see very often the importance of scribes and writing, a very, very important job in antiquity. Okay, we'll take a breather for now, and we will come back to do the last bits of uh, this element of chapter one, section three.